we take what the client is looking for and we try to resolve the problem. We try to look at it, the brief and we analyze that brief, okay? Um, and then we look at the best material. So it's, it's, a, it's a discussion. Um, the project that you are showing right now is um, a, a project I call The Bridge. Um, and this, the client is in the audience, um, um, Madam Aywa Afifa Taylor. Um, if I was here, maybe she can just wait. Um, yeah. Um, the, the reason why I mention her is that she's, for me, an exceptional client who understood the philosophy. And trust me, nothing you see there has changed. The building is in East Legon. We, we believe that we can change the building, the, the, the landscape, one building at a time. So we went into a neighborhood and, and we sort of asked all the questions. We saw all that was good about it and all that was bad about it. Actually, there was an existing building on site. And through a lot of analysis, I wanted to work with the existing building. We wanted to do a new building. So we sort of approached it you know, in two ways. And when she saw this product, everything changed. And that's what we as designers must do. We must challenge what we see. Um, it's a building that sits in the landscape and people, I mean, I'm sure you've had so many people Iowa, go there and ask who designed this. And that's also a problem because in their minds, that's why I think you asked, did you design that? Because good design shouldn't come from Ghana. In some sense. In some, yeah. No, no, I'm coming. No, I'm just relating to other things. But people think when they see certain things, it shouldn't be coming we are not a design-oriented sort of people, but I believe that we are. And I think that as one designs these spaces, whose philosophies are based on, on everything that is radical, the, the bottom of the building is so open and it's going to be exactly like that because I believe that one, first of all, God made us for a garden. Um, if you read the Bible, it doesn't talk about creating a building for man. He put him in a garden. So I drive around and I see all these buildings that sort of cut you off from nature. And and, 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 and and for the likes of me, I've never understood it. I've never understood it because we have the best weather in this in, the, in these parts. We have a great weather. It doesn't snow here. It doesn't get to very bad temperatures, you know, in, in, you know cold or, or warm. Um, and why do we then cut ourselves off? We're very colorful people. We love playing on the outside. So those are some of the ideas that we started playing with this, you know, from, and, and also what the client wanted. So it was sort of the master of what you survey, isn't it? If you're on a ship, uh, the captain stands on the bridge. So that's why we call it the bridge, because upstairs is the master bedroom. And, and it plays with just simplicity, light, you know, lines. It, it, it's very complex in structure. I mean, we've done very interesting things in, in that building, and it's not easy to just perceive by what it is you see. So. I believe in intelligence, um, and that's how I approach design. I think that the African is complex. Uh, I was just discussing with B that one of the projects we want to um, engage in is taking Edinkra symbols, right? Now, now that's frightening, just hearing that. But not traditionally just putting them on the wall. Because I think that is too literal. That's too, that, that's the baser instance, isn't it? We are more complex people. So it's taking those symbols and their uh, meanings and going into what is more abstract and seeing what we can create. I think that's what we speak to as a design firm. Thank you. Make it more concrete for us. What does good design, what does design look like and feel like to you in your work and in your world? Um, okay, in my world, I think a good design is one that flatters the person that I made an outfit for. Uh, therefore, I can make the most gorgeous dress or something that, you know, I think it's better than uh, Christian Dior. But if whoever I made it for doesn't look good in it, then uh, all my efforts, everything was completely futile. So for me, in that sense, um, because of the nature of my work, just like obviously Pianza and Augustus here, I'm doing something for somebody, uh, it has to look good in them. Now, Something looking, a perception and culture is very important. Um, I must mention that um, I did grow up outside of Ghana, so it's very possible that maybe my uh, criteria for beauty, uh, or what is nice, what is not nice, what is flattering to a particular type of body, is probably slightly Europeanized, I admit that. And so when I came back to Ghana, obviously when you when you you, know, you resettle, 
we need to take time to um, study or reconnect with the culture, understand what people value, you know, uh, the symbols, the colors. Uh, apart from that, of course, I do think that white look great on black people and black looks great on white people. I mean, that's like basic, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, I had a lot of um, issues initially when I decided to plunge into fashion. When people came to me and I, and I thought I was you know, doing the right thing by giving them advice and a lot of times um, inadvertently and unwillingly ended up offending them. Um, I was not tactless. You know, I was just trying to be, I, I guess in a way I'm kind of sort of straightforward. I've tried to polish that a bit uh, <laughs> over the years and say, you know, politically correct things, you know. Um, and so basically a lot of times I've had issues, uh, or not issues, I've had instances rather where I've tried to advise people and tell them that this is more flattering. This will bring out your beautiful, gorgeous bust and your amazing lips and whatever and your fantastic calves. But then folks are very, some folks were very set in their ways. So I was torn between being an artist and being a commercial person and being a salesperson because I mean, I was running a business and I wanted to sell. But at the same time, um, Somebody walking out of my shop having left so much money and yet I felt they didn't really quite look like I wasn't going to be happy bumping into them in town or, or being proud or saying that I'm the one who did it. It bothered me a lot. I, I must be honest. I mean, it really, really bothered me. And so I had to find ways. I mean, I almost became like a psychologist, you know, like basically conning people into trying to wear something that I thought would flatter the person. Because we do come from a culture, I mean, and Augustus here just mentioned it, where uh, Mr. Mensa saw Mr. Ansa's house and he likes it, so he wants the same thing. I had the same issues, you know. Uh, Madame Mary went to church and saw Miss Agnes wearing a dress and comes to me and says she wants the same thing. And, you know, morphologically, they are completely two different human beings, you know, in terms of shape, in terms of color. And, and here I am busy trying not to offend Miss Agnes and tell her that you would look like a cupboard in this outfit, you know. And it was really difficult. It would, truly was because I wanted, I wanted to be proud and happy. You know, but then at the same time, I kept asking myself, am I trying to project my sense of what is beautiful on somebody? So it's very delicate. You need to, I don't know what Uncle Ansa here will say afterwards, but for me, it was, a, it was a learning process and it was, you know, of course, at some point, some customers probably just stopped coming to me or sometimes they just, I just, when they, were, when they came to the shop and I wasn't there, then that's a different thing because I did have, uh, I had a rack with clothes, so I didn't participate in you know them choosing. They would pick up something, and even then, even then, I would bump into them at Golden Tulip, and you know try to tell them, oh, why don't you come by the shop and this and that. And then when they come, if I can, some you know, when you come and bring the dress, you know I have some interesting ideas, so I could try and adjust something about it because I really thought it was important for me. It was, my, my clothes were like my children and my customers were like my family. And so I, I, was, I was very emotionally connected to both the people who bought the clothes from me and the clothes themselves. So it was never commercial. I don't know whether that made me a good designer or not, but I went to bed feeling good about myself. And that was very important to me. Thank you. And the clients wept all night. <laughs> Design. Um, I'm actually challenged here to know what angle to take this topic here because it's too broad. It's too, it affects everything we do. And um, the young architect, I used to lecture some time ago at some university in England. Um, I shan't drop names. But I used to lecture the principles and philosophy of fashion. What's your philosophy? And once you've established that, what is your, what's your methodology? How do you, uh, okay, so you like creating the evening wear. That's your philosophy, your learning. How do you interpret the evening wear? And coming back to Augustus, so you see, simplicity is complicated, refined. To do simple, for it to work is very difficult. When you leave college, 
you want to throw about 10 designs into one garment. And you know, it goes from here, 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 here. I'm not uh, talking about my uh, department here, but I like architecture. Art is interrelated. The Scott House, I don't know if a lot of people have actually observed why it works. It is the inorganic and the organic working in total harmony. There's a big tree in that house, oh no, in the compound, around which the house was put as the background to the tree. So the tree is that element. With that tree being that element, they couldn't pass the background, so he just used lines to facilitate the effectiveness of that big tree. That's my architectural bit there. Um, I spent some four months in architecture and I had a rationale. If I put, I designed a house and somebody was stupid enough to pay me to put up that house and I got it wrong to be sitting there staring at me for the rest of my life. <laughs> so at least, fashion is seasonal. When I put a garment on you, three months, it doesn't work. <laughs> you say, Kofi, I didn't wear that dress, so really? I've got another one. I've got another. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> Hyperbole started in fashion. We had, when we were at school, at one point we had these huge afros. And do anything, don't touch anybody's afro. Because, you see, that was the design of the time. In the 60s, uh, am I letting uh, the secret of my age? I don't even want to go back to the 50s. <laughs> Okay, it took you about one hour to get that perfect round. You put your towel in hot water, you squeeze it, and you hold it, and then you go <laughs> in the mirror to have the Western picket look. And then an uncle comes and says, Oh, Fifi! <laughs> and he goes, Grr, I'll kill you! Okay. We went through the Afro scene. Then after that, we came to the Tokyo Joe, where you moved every piece of hair. I'm talking about design as a function here, and it is all a state of mind. In our head, and I was a barber at school when I was at, uh, I was at Winneba. I was a school barber. I actually used to go to uh, the boarding school with an empty chop box. By the end of that week, uh, and I was quite disciplined in my creative design. If you bring a corned beef, and I had a, an account and he puts it down, four haircuts, sardine, two, a ton of milk, one. So you can get into credit. And, uh, and everybody was dry at school, I was still floating. <laughs> now that's design and business. <laughs> Innovativeness and creativity, okay? But really, this topic is so important because Ghana has some really beautiful attributes. I don't want to talk about clothes. But we need to have that discipline in creativity. That discipline in creativity is design. The home that we live in has to be functional. The streets we drive on have to be functional. Even the way they are forced, the police police us. You are in London, you go through a red light. By the time you get to the next red light, there's a, a copper standing there. You know, play, play, you know, stop. They are going to get you for what you are worth. In Ghana here, the police are like, oh, Charlie, and then you go. <laughs> Unknowing to you, some little child saw the red light, wanted to cross, you knock the child down. So this is the discipline in the design that I'm talking about. Uh, we're going to go around. I have too much to say, but uh, I don't want to waffle on. So let's move on to the next. Uh, no, you're barely waffling on. Yeah, you're dazzling us. It's razzle dazzle right now, and it's, uh, it's amazing. I, 
I actually want to do a, some quick follow-up questions to each of you and some of what you said. Um, you, you speak a lot about design as discipline. Design is discipline. But at the same time, some of the other panelists have talked about the uniqueness of design. But it feels like it, is design as discipline doesn't mean that it's, it's structuring as rather as opposed to you know giving everybody something different and original and innovative you don't give the same dress i mean what kind of discipline why do we need that discipline it's the discipline which makes that chaotic you see a creative person at work is like opening about uh, somebody said about 127 applications on a computer because it, it, it is a form of madness. <laughs> All the different intangibles have to be brought to bear. But you see, I disagree slightly with Augustus. I like the challenge. People bring me the most stupid of fabrics. <laughs> that is uh, my point of view. I'm being subjective here. Okay. Impossible fabrics. And they say, oh, we, we know you can do something out of it. And initially I go, no, 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 no. Then I look at it again, excuse my language, you bastard, I'm going to have you. <laughs> then I work with that fabric to try and make sense of it. That is just for my own ego and self-satisfaction. So if somebody comes to me and say, I saw that dress. You see, B was just making enemies. She doesn't know that she lives in Ghana. <laughs> and, uh, people are very conservative. Um, so they come, I saw that dress and I like it. Why bother saying no? Just say yes and then design her something new. I said, oh, but it's not that dress. I said, I know, I tried to make that dress for you, but I realized halfway through that that dress would not work for you, so I adapted it to see it you. See the psychology, you know. And there's a lady who studies psychology. <laughs> Be you fail miserably. <laughs> but design has to adapt to individual tastes. We are the orchestrators, the arbiters of it. I conduct. You come to my studio and you see me. At any given time, I'm thinking of about 20 things. Conducting those hand dresses are being made. Any given minute, I'll call the machinist and say, okay, let me see how this is going and what I'm designing, what I'm yet to do, and all that. Um, the discipline is what makes it work. And I'm sorry to say, there are a whole lot of people in this country here, this time here, who call themselves designers. They are not. They are chaos merchants. Thank you. Oh, wow, chaos merchants. I hope there are no chaos merchants around these parts. Uh, B, I'd like to follow up with you in almost uh, a different view from what I'm going to be. Interesting story about innovation and eating crowd symbols. And, and uh, I think you, you, you value the originality and innovation. And can you tell that story and also tell us why, why for you it is so important in design to have that, that kind of innovation and originality? Okay. First of all, I want to answer what, uh, or rather give a, a replique to what Uncle Kofi here said. Um, where I come from, where I grew up, I come from Solpon. But where I grew up, they say, if you don't have enemies, then you're really not a person of substance because you're worth jack because you can't please everybody and I've never tried to so uh, I made a lot of friends too I, I, I still have customers from 20 years you know ago who still no matter where in the world they are they still come back to me because they know I'm honest they know I would never sell them something that I think makes them look like kakamotobi or anything like that so that's just <laughs> thank you anyway um, I guess I do believe in originality um, when I came down apart from Kofi Ansa's absolutely gorgeous unaffordable dresses uh, <laughs> <laughs> Most people were doing things that I found uh, basically quite banal, you know, to put it mildly. And um, they were not fun to wear. I, I actually, I didn't think that anything was fun. We had uh, very elegant, what we wear traditionally, don't get me wrong, our traditional kaba and slit is very beautiful. 
you know, it's very elegant and I love it. And um, it was probably very appropriate for the traditional events that we had to attend, be it a funeral, or christening, going to church. Uh, but back in the day, you know, if you compare the scene then to now, now we wear short mini dresses and, and wax print to everywhere, to, to the nightclub. Back in the day, it was not so. Nobody was really doing that. Wax print and traditional cloth was reserved for church, exactly, for Sunday, for the funeral, whatever. So nobody was doing that. And having, having grown up out there and coming back as a diaspora, I really wanted to reconnect with my, with my Ghanaian heritage because I was busy reading Dostoevsky and Pushkin in Russia. So, you know, when I came back, all this was new to me, it was fresh, and a totally different take on things. I was very proudly Ghanaian, and I wanted to, you know, work with all of this. But then, uh, the good thing about, about being mixed race or, or a person of, of multi-heritage is that you get to fuse your different heritages, your different cultures. And I realize if I, if I just go about embroidering or, in my case, painting Jin Me or Dinkra symbols, it's boring in a way because it's what everybody else was doing. So I invented basically symbols by um, combining bits of Cyrillic letters with a Dinkra symbol. So I came up with completely different symbols. and. Uh, I even managed to sell a dress to, for me it was a huge achievement, I managed to sell a dress to the Russian ambassador's wife, who uh, I think prior to that wouldn't be caught dead wearing anything, you know, made in Africa at all. It's out of the question, you know what I mean? So uh, for me it was, I was, I was happy that I managed to, you know, get the, the Russian ambassador's wife to want to wear something that was made in Ghana. Uh, I consider myself Ghanaian, so buy a Ghanaian but had and had enough of Ghanaianness to the outfit and yet because it had that Russian touch to it she found it interesting so she was very happy uh, to wear it so for me it was all about coming up with something different something new and it was about innovation the good thing is that because the Ghanaian there was enough Ghanaianness in what I did so it still appealed to your regular you know Ghanaian person who was looking for an outfit for an engagement for an outdooring it wasn't too uh, it wasn't too far from our culture, so that it still appealed. So I don't, I like uni, I like, I went into this whole thing not because I wanted to make 500 dresses that look the same. I was, I'm, I was never interested in that. And there are enough people in the world doing that. I think um, in, 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 in Africa, in, in Ghana, in Africa, um, custom made clothes are relatively much more affordable than anywhere else. So for me, I think, you know, in, in, in Europe, I know it's a luxury. It costs, it costs so much money to make a dress, you know, go to a seat. I mean, who goes to designers to have dresses made for them? I, you know, but here we have this luxury. So I never understood why, if I have access to somebody like Kofi Ansa, why would I go and want him to do the same dress that he did for somebody when he could do something unique? So my thing is, yes, it is a discipline. It is a discipline in terms of, of course, if you're supposed to cut a straight line this way, you can't cut it that way, then it's not a straight line. It is a discipline, because it's a science. That's what makes it a discipline, because it's a science. You have to cut patterns, you have to cut lines. A human body is, it is it says there's a certain topography or morphology, so obviously to cut a pair of pants, you have to cut it this way, and to, to cut a skirt, you have it. That makes it a discipline. But in terms of creativity, it's endless. There's so many things we can do with the same fabric that I never understood why, unless it was uniform, Unless we're, you know, we're actually making uniform. I never understood why people would want even to wear the same thing. So in that sense, I I always follow the originality, individuality line, and uh, that's been my philosophy throughout. <laughs> Thank you. Nice. I guess this question is for you. Yeah, you didn't answer me because you're a very philosophical guy. But you know me, I make music, and I really hope that good music is good business so it's good design good business i mean bottom line i need to know why does design matter am i going to be successful you know if we're focusing on design what's the bottom line here why does design matter is good design good business is, is it something that in your estimation is, is is proven to work i mean should we worry about that um 
I, I think good design is good business, um, and not because it's cliche and it's written in a lot of um, manuals. And uh, of course, I did some research before coming to what the world thought about good design. But I'll bring it down to our um, level. Um, this hotel we are in, how old is it? It's been done all these years. Whatever investment they made here has kept, you know, turning over. Everybody loves the place, they love the environment. In fact, recently, they just read it, some of the interiors to, you know, bring it into this century. But it's a flexible design. So, yes, good design is, uh, is, is, is good business. Um, let me also relate it to housing. Um, there's a lot of apartments going on in our landscape, all right? Um, there are a lot of, that's why I said good design. So there's a lot of bad design going on with some of those apartments in some areas. The ones that have stuck to being good and have done no research but read a few, you realize that they are always, it's simple mathematics. If everybody's going to go charging $3,500 for an apartment, I might as well go to the one that is the best, the one that has sort of catered for all my needs, the one that responds to the environment, you know, the one that really appeals to me. Um, and it's at that point that good design, you know, we think we don't know good design, but we do. Uh, when you see something that's good, and let me relate it to cars, let me relate it to cars. Everybody sees an S-Class and it's something else. All right, it's never changed. If somebody sees a BM7 series, it doesn't change. So I'm very convinced that people will see the right thing when they see it. So if you if you don't mind and you hire somebody, and again, like uh, Uncle Kofi said uh, earlier, um, we, we have an onus on us as clients who interface with architects to select the right designer. Um, and somebody will say, well, how do you do that? It, it, some of those people have built before. Um, you can go and see what they've done. In fact, some people have gone to see works that we've done and given us a phone call. And I think for any architect, that's how it really sort of works. But there are also those young people, because remember, almost, if, if my mind says we were almost four years of uh, coming out of school, most of my designs were on paper and, and, and uh, in, in 3Ds. But people saw the ideas and wanted to go on an odyssey to try and see if we could change the way we, we live. Uh, so to say. And I've realized that those who've done those good designs, I mean, I, I, let me be careful about that, but the village you sitting there, people are buying. Why? Because there's been some effort to try and create some icon, something that sits away from the community. And if I dare say, you realize now that a lot more people are following, are following it. So you can't also be somebody who always goes with what's always existed. You, you have to sort of look for something that challenges the way we live, all right? If you if you look at that, th those, Villaggio would rent earlier than most of the other properties, just because people want to be in that enclave. Design is a, is a price element, all right? So that is one uh, thinking. You are going to make money if you design the thing very well. If you hire a role to do it, the role will tell their clients that we have the following three, but we have our preferences. We think you should go here because everything works. It's not just the looks. It's how it works. It's how the engineering has been done. It's how the water flows to so many things. Let's come home to homes, houses. And a lot of people will come and approach and say, oh, I want to do my home. And oh, you know, just do something for me. And I say to them, it's an asset. A house is an asset. Um, you could create a house and it would have a sculptural value that somebody from somewhere would come and stand there, look at the building and tell you, here's a check, get out of the house. And maybe the house cost X. But the value they place on it, they are willing to pay anything to stay in those buildings. I am privileged to know that the person who is staying in the Scott house now, I think it's a, a French businessman, went to Mrs. Scott and told Mrs. Scott that if he doesn't sort of rent the facility, somebody would come in because it's not making money, you know, destroy it. But he was interested in keeping that element. Scott House was built in 1957. It still has a value and it's still earning money for the owner. So I think it's important for us, especially the public, clients, architects, and it's a challenge to everybody, the developers, the architects, everybody. Sometimes they think architects or creative people are worrying them, but we are not. We're actually looking for your best. Think about it. I won't live in the building. 
It's your building. And we're having a discussion about how we can create a great space. I, I personally believe that that is an opportunity for us to show how great a people we are. Because I believe we're a great people. I, I personally believe that we are a great people and that our buildings, like our clothes, you know, should tell. Ghanaians have excelled to so many places. That's important. So if you ask me, it's good business. But a client of, of mine, I won't mention his name, who was sitting, you know, in his house said, when I bring my partners here, they would sign a million dollars tomorrow. So I think it's good business. <laughs>